Nothing will crush a real estate investor's spirit like landlord stress. The difference between being successful and miserable in managing properties is education. Welcome to Landlord University, where landlords learn. Landlord University is recorded from inside the rent prep office where Stephen White and Jeff Pearson share the lessons learned from working with some of the most successful landlords. Welcome to Landlord University in the News. I'm Jeff Pearson. I'm here with my co-host, Stephen White. Hello, Stephen. How are you doing? Pretty good, Jeff. Uh, obviously excited for another episode of In the News. We've got Jennifer uh, on with us, and she's going to share uh, some articles that she's plucked out that are relevant to uh, to landlords today. So, Jennifer, what, what did you find for us today? Well, hi, everyone. Today, uh, the first article has to do with legislative sessions that are going on all over this the country. Uh, this is uh, about a bill that's being introduced in the state of Washington, and it would require a longer notice from landlords to tenants any time that they want to hike the rent. Uh, currently, Washington state law requires 30 days of notice, and Seattle, the city, requires 60 days of notice. But this new law would change all of that to a 90-day notice from landlords to tenants. Uh, the idea behind the bill is that tenants would need more time to pull their resources together when they're getting ready to move from one place to another. And if they get a, a rent increase, they want to have that option to move. Um, but it might take time to pull together like a security deposit and first and last month's rent, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, landlord groups, of course, aren't happy with this proposal, and they're claiming that it's really unfair to landlords and it'll really cause landlords to lose money in the long run. So what do you guys think about this bill? Well, I, I'm i trying to think of it really logically. And, you know, from a landlord's perspective, I don't think that additional time makes that big of a difference. I'm trying to think in what what case scenario do you say, I don't have 90 days to raise the rent. I need to do it now. You know, and it, I think that if, you know, th that extra month or two, raising it from 60 to 90 or even from 30 to, to 90, I, I really, you know, I, I feel like you usually know ahead of time if you're going to raise the rent and giving them that time, I think seems fair. I, I, I wouldn't have much of an issue with it. I think it's interesting. One of the quotes in here says, landlords are making a lot of money in this market right now, and it's not unreasonable to give tenants more time to move. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you pointed that out because I, <laughs> I read that too, and I thought that that's going to get under the skin of a lot of tenants or a lot of uh, landlords, right? Exactly. So <laughs> right. what they're implying is that they want to give tenants more time to prepare to move out. If you're going to raise the rent, you should give them 90 days to prepare to move out. And I think within reason it makes sense because certainly moving is a major undertaking. And yes, you have to be sure that you have enough money for first and last and deposit and all of that. And if you raise the rent significantly, then you know, giving that type of notice so that they have the opportunity to prepare makes sense. And I agree with what you said, Steve. It's not that big a deal as a landlord to say, you know what, I'm going to be raising the rent. And, you know, 30 days from now, I'll, I'll raise the rent. And so you go to your tenant, you, you give them three months notice. Uh, you know, at first glance, it seems pretty simple and straightforward. But at the same time, I mean, we run on on month to month leases. So if you're on a month to month, then suddenly this 90 day rent increase seems a little bit strange because it's out of whack with with that month to month lease or or rental agreement. But when you have an annual um, an annual lease, then to give them a heads up 90 days in advance that you're going to raise the, the rent, I tend to agree. Um, what's what's the big deal? And you, know, yeah, you certainly have to be bit well prepared. You have to put it on your calendar. If you want to raise their rent, you're going to have to remind yourself 90 days in advance to send that letter out. But ultimately, it's not that big a deal. And hopefully, you're not doing 30 and 40% increases. You know, you're keeping it within reason. But I think what they're implying with that comment about landlords making a lot of money is that rents have gone up so much that everybody is just rolling in the dough. Right. Well, the other thing I'm thinking too, like you mentioned 30, 40% increase, which I think would be extremely high. You know, there, yes. you know, most of the time a rent increase is pretty minimal and usually it's built into, you know, a, a lease already. So if they're going to, you know, from year to year, it'll go up 3%. Um, you know, so what's the difference really on on an extra sixty days? What is that to the you know the bottom line to the landlord? What's that going to be? Forty, fifty dollars? You know, as you know, in total, I I just don't feel like it's it's really worth uh, fighting about. Now, 
on a, you know, from a different perspective, I understand from a landlord's angle of it's another, you know, it's, it's, it's more flexibility they have to have. It's another thing that they're, you know, that's, that's changing in their, in their world. And, and I know specifically in the state of Washington, just as the state of Oregon, there's a lot of changes going on in the, in the rental industry out there. And, you know, they, they sort of feel like they're being attacked. And so I'm sure this is just sort of piling on to a whole number of things and the, you know, it's just a matter of having to, uh, to stand up for some of it. So, but I, I don't see it as, you know, such a huge nuisance to the landlord that uh, it's going to change the way they do business or anything. Right. I have a couple of thoughts. I think, you know, as far as those 30, 40% rent increases, I think those are happening in the really hot markets. And those are landlords that are taking advantage of a hot market and doing everything they can to, to take advantage of it. Mm. You're right. You know, most increases are going to be reasonable. They're going to be some small percentage. And I would almost suggest in this type of a proposal, if you're going to do a 90 days, say it's going to be 90 days if it's above a 10% increase, you can do less than 10% or you can say 7 or 8%, whatever seems reasonable. And anything less than that requires the standard 30-day notice or the 60 days that Seattle requires. And what that could do is landlords to not go above that percentage. So you might use that to limit your percentage increases. You could also on the flip side say that if a tenant is going to move out, if you've provided the 90, provided the 90 day notice, then they have to give 60 day notice that they're going to mm-hmm. move out. So put a little bit of the burden on the tenants as well. Right. Yeah. I think there'd be a nice balance there between the two as well. Mm-hmm. But it is an interesting one. It'll be interesting to follow this to see if that goes through. That's still something they're looking at, right, Jennifer? Correct. It's a proposed uh, bill that's going through the legislative session right now. Okay. Yeah, not shocking. Like I said, uh, up there in the uh, you know the Northwest, we're seeing, you know, from an industry perspective in the background check industry, we're seeing a lot of changes coming down. Um, for example, Oregon. I know we've mentioned on the show before, mm-hmm. Oregon changed the reporting limitations on evictions from seven years to five years. Right. Um, you know, things like that can definitely have an adverse impact on a landlord. Um, so I think at some point they're they're digging their heels in and saying enough is enough. So, you know, I'm, I'm sure that uh, like these advocacy groups that are watching out for the landlords, like in this case, it's the Rental Housing Association of Washington that's proposing to fight the bill. Um, I think they have a certain responsibility to just kind of fight this stuff across the board. But again, you know, like Jeff mentioned, I I don't see this having such a huge impact on landlords unless you're looking to gouge and, and increase a ridiculous amount and you really will be out hundreds of dollars. But even still, you know, it's you're out the money, you, you turn the tenant over and if you can get the rent, great, get it and re-rent the place and, you know, you're starting from a fresh lease. That's right. Perfect. Well, Jennifer, let's see what we have next on the docket. Sure. This next news story is out of Pennsylvania. The Recently, the Pennsylvania governor is publicly encouraging legislation to protect gay and transgender people from discrimination in employment, public accommodation, and housing. So among other things, this means that landlords in Pennsylvania could not discriminate against gay or transgender people when renting property. Uh, There are already 34 municipalities in Pennsylvania that do have this protection in place, and the governor would like to see that become state law. Uh, Currently, 18 states and the District of Columbia already have housing and employment non-discrimination laws that cover sexual orientation and gender identity. And if the governor gets his way, Pennsylvania will, of course, be added to that list. Now, I know that many states this time of year are looking at similar bills in this legislative session, including my home state. So I wanted to talk about what landlords should know about this new wave of legislation. Yeah, and perfect timing. Um, you know, I just read an article this morning talking about sort of, you know, the Supreme Court ruling um, on gay marriage and, you know, really talking about the direction that everything is going and makes you wonder, you know, I mean, I feel like we're living in kind of like, uh, you know, the 60s in the civil rights movement in a time where we're, we're seeing some huge changes develop in this area. And it's obviously going to impact many industries. And obviously, the rental industry is a big one. I think there's no question what you were talking about, Stephen. I heard the same stuff about the Supreme Court today. And the impact that this should have on landlords should be pretty minor. Because I would expect that in most situations, landlords aren't 
aren't discriminating. I would like to hope that most landlords in this day and age aren't discriminating. Certainly there are people in in di- different parts of the country that, that are more conservative than others as far as this particular topic goes. But when it really comes down to it, we've talked before about running running this like a business. And when you talk about things like discrimination, whether it's LBGT or race discrimination or you know, single mothers or whatever you want it to be, the best thing for a landlord is to not discriminate. Mm-hmm. Establish what your standards are for the tenant that you want in your property, taking all of those things out of those standards so that it comes down to the basic facts of their ability to pay, their rental history, their job history and stability. You take all of those, you put them together along with a, a certain portion of gut instinct and you make a determination as to who the best tenant is. But if you run it like a business, if you if you establish your standards in writing before you move forward, then you can take this stuff, this type of stuff out of the equation. And if these laws are being passed in your area, you have to make sure that you're not discriminating. And the only way to make sure that you can prove that is to establish these standards and always follow these standards. Yeah, and something that we've been talking a little bit about lately uh, or sort of the I think what's becoming the new mantra for landlords is principal can be expensive. Yes. You know, um, I, I think this is a clear cut case of it. Like you said, treating it as a business, looking at the applicants in simple terms of are they qualified, you know, not you know, any type of discriminatory way based on, you know, uh, classes or things that aren't, you know, uh, classified yet. But at the end of the day, I mean, if they're paying the rent and they're a good tenant, um, you got to rent to them. That's I mean, right. it's, it's really just as simple as that. And I, you know, where I, in my area, I, I don't see it being huge, but you're right. There are definitely conservative areas and certain people that I think maybe this type of legislation might be required. Um, but uh, I, I think we're, I think we're about to see some really major changes on this front all around. So this makes sense that this is, uh, you know, an issue that's coming up. Yes, very much so. Yeah. And Jennifer, in your, uh, in your area up there in, in Utah, um, what type of, uh, what, what's the, the temperature out there? What's the feeling there? Mm. Well, of course, Utah is a pretty conservative state, and there's a, a fairly large constituency here that has a lot to say about LGBT issues. But um, there is a bill currently going through right now. It was dead on arrival last year during the legislative session, but there's a bill in place right now that is moving forward to um, extend those rights to LGBT uh, in employment and in housing. And so a lot of people around here um, who are interested in making sure that those rights are extended are, are quite excited and hopefully it'll get some legs and push through this year. I do know that uh, our northern neighbor, Idaho, uh, went ahead and struck down a little earlier this session a similar thing. Mm-hmm. So in some of these more conservative states, you know, there's there's still an uphill battle, but hopefully that, you know, the tide is turning and, and, and we'll see more of uh, these protections extended state by state by state. And I know that it's it's difficult for some people who have very strong religious beliefs to think that they're going to be, quote, supporting somebody who lives an LGBT lifestyle, and therefore that goes against their religious beliefs. My, my suggestion would be, especially if you're in a situation where you are being mandated that you have to do it based on law, don't look at it in terms of the fact that you're supporting their lifestyle. Rather, you're supporting another person, another common man who needs your support because you have a place to rent and they can rent from you. And you as a good person, if they're the right person for that that property, then rent to them and be a good person. I think that's kind of the bottom line. Yeah. And, uh, I agree. <laughs> yeah. And if you're doing that well, where you can allow, you know, that type of, uh, principal judgment to, to make decisions, um, I guess good for you, but still, I mean, at the end of the day, they're a good tenant is supporting you as well. So you should really be looking for the best tenant, exactly. you know, all any, anything else should be a far second, you know, at the end of the day, it really matters. Do they have the ability to to pay the rent, and are they going to be a, a good long term tenant for me? If the answer to those questions are yes, then you know, end of story. You you, you got to rent to them. It, it makes great business sense. Then at that point, that's right. 
Well, Jennifer, thank you very much for bringing these two articles to us, and we will try to keep an eye on these and report back on them sometime in the near future. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you both. Talk to you again next week. Thanks for listening to Landlord University. And remember to visit rentprep.com slash landlordu to see show notes and access free resources like forms and guides. And be sure to check out Jeff Pearson hosting his own hit podcast at thementorimpact.com.